This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast, this is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on mobile, or on smart speaker. This is our auto expert. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen. As we head into the holiday season, um, everybody's scrambling to buy cars at the end of the year. We were talking about that on today's show, a little bit of that. Also, some of those new vehicles that are hitting dealerships. Uh, Mark Gillis is going to join us. Gillies is going to join us from VW. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark's going to talk about the reveal of the Atlas Cross Sport at the LA show. I actually went to the reveal of the show of the uh, LA Cross or the Atlas Cross Sport in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is the factory that's going to be built. They're going to actually uh, create 10,000 jobs there. That's fantastic. Um, that's uh, an interesting taking a three-row, making it a two-row. Brandon Ramirez joining us from Hyundai to talk about the new Ionic. The price remains the same, but it goes from around 130-plus miles uh, on a single charge up to 170 for the same money. And also talking about the Vision T, which is their look at what SUVs will look like in the future. Ooh, it had a really amazing light fixture or light sequence at the top. The whole bumper and grill lights up. So it's really kind of cool. Nice. Right? Instead of having headlights where they used to be, because they used to be sort of incandescent lamps, now with LEDs you can make the whole car a light, basically. So this, this is, is a concept car. Yeah, yes, definitely okay. a concept car. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, we're gonna, Debbie from Ford is going to join us to talk about how McDonald's and Ford are joining forces to turn coffee grounds, the, uh, the leftovers from making the McDonald's cafe lattes, <laughs> into car parts. I'm wondering how that works in the rain. <laughs> You're like, oh, my bumper just washed away. Uh, we just be careful of that. You have Mike, to wait and find out. Uh, the other half of Mike Cordell is going to join. Uh, the other half of our auto expert, Mike Cordell, is going <laughs> to join us. Uh, Mike is going to talk about uh, some cool stuff that he's been doing in the auto industry. Plus, Anton Warman, we're going to uh, take a look at some of the interesting electric and autonomous features that are coming. I also was shared a little piece of information about what's going to happen at CES, which is the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, Las Vegas in January. They're going to have such a massive reveal. It's really tough when car companies come to you and tell you something, but tell you you can't tell anyone. And I'm sitting there with this heavy weight that I'm carrying. I'm like, oh, it's That's okay. Just tell me later. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell everybody as soon as I'm uh, legally, legally bound. Legally able take, to. Otherwise, I don't want to go to jail. It's I'm too pretty to go to prison. Uh, we're also going to... We also want to talk about some of the cars I've actually been test driving this week. So uh, I went on the Mitsubishi... No, I went on the uh, Hyundai Sonata launch in uh, Scottsdale, and it was the same place that they had the Mercedes launch. Interesting, I went to straight afterwards. But with the Hyundai Sonata, so this is a car that sort of uh, materialized around 1985 in Korea. It didn't really come to the States until the late 80s, early 90s, and has been a staple of the Hyundai lineup. And even though sedans aren't everybody's favorite anymore, this vehicle, it's pretty amazing. So it has three features that I think are going to uh, make it stand out. You can use your cell phone as a key, which means that, you know, you can just tap it on the door. You don't actually have to physically carry the key. You can put it in the, uh, the recharger, the wireless charging port, and use it as a key. You can send the key to someone else. Even the cool things with these vehicles is now, so, you know, a lot of people have kids. Imagine you're at a soccer game with your kid, and your kid wants to go to the car and put something in the car. I want to put, Mom, can I put my iPad in the car while we watch the game? Yeah, go ahead. You would have to give them the key, right, If unless you were close enough to unlock it from wherever you were sitting. So you give them the key. No longer do you have to do that. What you can do is give them rights to unlock the car with their cell phone, but that's all it does. Just unlock the car. They can't start it and drive it away. That's so cool. that's really, really cool. Um, that's the first thing that does. Then, then it also has this really cool light fixture. So traveling up the side of the hood is a long piece of chrome. It goes right into the window. But that chrome, actually at night, uh, a third of that chrome turns into lights. Oh, so the amazing. lights travel up the side of the hood. It's so cool in the dark. And then you, the, you know my mom had one of those. A Sonata. Yeah. yeah. Saved her life. 
It did? It did. Uh, because she got into an accident? Yeah. Or like it it knew how to do, I don't know. Yeah, it, she was in an accident okay. and it, yeah, she flipped it and it totally saved her life. She didn't have a scratch on her. The oh. car was completely totaled. Well, that's that's yeah. the way it needs to be. Exactly. You know, so we, every we time you talk cars, about sonatas, we yeah, we can't I get replace, excited. <laughs> we can't replace moms. Exactly. Uh, and then the other thing it does, which is probably the most outstanding thing, is it will you can drive it for up to 30 feet from outside the car with a key fob. Really? Yeah. That's so awesome. I have a, if you go to my Facebook page or our Auto Experts Facebook page, I put it on the Facebook page here. I think it already has like twenty thousand views or something. I but did you, see that. You you I mean you basically start the car and then you hold the button down, it will drive forward for thirty feet and if someone walks in front of it or it comes to an object, it'll just stop. Which is really cool. I thought that was excellently cool. So, well, uh, you know, that's one of the things I was testing. I was also driving the new GLB, which is Mercedes-Benz uh, small entry-level uh, SUV. I did that in Scottsdale as well. That's pretty cool. And I also drove, while I was in Scottsdale, the CLA, the new one, the second generation. This is the car that brought the average age of a Mercedes buyer down to the 50, uh, low 50s. And it used to be in the high 60s, like 68 used to be the average uh, age of a Mercedes-Benz owner. Now it brought that car brought it down to like 52. So it's younged up the brand considerably uh, as well. Also this week I have been driving the uh, very nice um, Mitsubishi uh, Eclipse Cross Sport uh, sorry, Eclipse Cross. Eclipse Cross is like the entry-level SUV, and I think one of the reasons that it impresses me most, it starts at just, it did, 2019 start at just over 23,000. This 2020 starts at under 23,000, so they dropped it close to $1,000 in price. Uh, and it has that 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty, which you don't get many cars at entry level. It's definitely an entry-level SUV, uh, inexpensive SUV. Also been driving Mercedes-Benz GLC, which is their midsize SUV. And that has the uh, the MBUX system in it, the Hey Mercedes. Yes, and what we was doing. I doing all morning? Yeah, yeah, when we were driving here this morning <laughs> from the coffee shop, uh, Jen said, Hey Mercedes, tell me a joke. She goes, I can't tell you a joke. I'm watching the road. I know. I'm like, She's come like, on, Mercedes. Wow. I know. Uh, and then you were trying to get it to do math. It, it does math. Yeah. It also does some things you may not want it to do. Like you can talk to it in natural speech. You can say, hey, Mercedes, find me. And I now imagine all these people listening to us in their Mercedes and it's going off because they're hearing. You say, hey, Mercedes, find me an Asian restaurant in my area that is not sushi. And it will find you at an Asian restaurant, which is not sushi. You can talk to it in natural speech, just like I'm talking to you. Instead of yelling at, hey, Alexa. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot of these cars are difficult to talk to. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about that uh, brand new VW uh, on the show. With Mark Gillis is going to join us to talk about the Atlas Crossboard next on Our Auto Expert. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. The amount of cars that are produced in the United States seems to be growing. And one company that's leading that uh, force of growing the amount of cars produced here is VW. Well, Gilly's joining us from VW to talk about the latest vehicle that was unveiled at the LA Auto Show, uh, shown off for the first time at a auto show in the United States, is built in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it is an addition to the Atlas family. It's the Cross Sport, which is a two-row version. Uh, Mark, what was the reaction that you got out of the LA show taking what is probably one of the best three-row SUVs in the United States and making it into a two-row? Well, I think the, the um, reaction has been really good, actually. I mean, we, we actually showed the car for the first time down in Chattanooga at the factory, and, you know, the, the uh, reaction was overwhelmingly positive. And then uh, we went to, to to L.A., and again, people really seemed to, to dig the truck. I mean, I, I think it's um, it's certainly pretty aggressive and, and bold-looking vehicle, um, and, you know, it gives a, a little bit more sort of sportiness to the way the car looks. Um, keeps the stuff that people like about the Atlas and replaces the, the third row with actually a bit more luggage room behind the behind the second row seats and you know it's it's pretty big in there so it's uh, you know we're looking forward to it going on sale uh, in the spring and um, you know I think it would be hopeful it'll do pretty well. I think one of the things that that always catches a lot of my friends out and, and I is you know we always think we want a third row. But uh, in the vehicles that I own that have third rows, they never actually get put up. They're always folded down because you need that extra space. So it probably makes sense for a lot of people. But you made the back a, a lot more sexy, sort of gave it that coupe-like swoopiness. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the, the key things about it because you want to give it some differentiation on the lot. Um, and obviously, if you don't have a third row, you've got the ability to, to change the roof line a bit. Uh, and like you, I mean, a, a third row, I, I'm the kind of person, you know, we all, we all have company vehicles and I've looked at an Atlas and I'm like, you know, it's too big, but cross sport, you know, makes sense for me because I, I do a bit of towing uh, with my old race cars. And, you know, it's got loads of space for tools and wheels and all the, you know, junk that I carry around when I'm going racing, um, you know, with my old GTI. I see that uh, some of the things on this are updated from the regular Atlas. So it got a few changes in areas we might eventually see on the Atlas. What was a what was different at uh, the front end from the Atlas? Um, I mean, if you look if you look at the front end, the, 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 the grill's different. Obviously, the front bumper's different. Uh, the rear bumper's different. It's got LED uh, head and tail lights. The the, the, the the actual bumper treatment is a lot more aggressive, but also the the grill's been changed, so it's a bit more modern and, and um, sort of, what's the word? Uh, the graphics are a bit stronger around the front. And then, you know, in terms of uh, features, you know, we've got some new um, driver assist features that are available for this car on the first time. Uh, plus, we get things like wireless charging and, and Wi-Fi ability in the vehicle, which we haven't had before. I think you've always been a leader at VW in tech. If you look at the whole group, a group as a whole, which includes everything up to Lamborghini and everything in between, you've always sort of been doing advancements in tech, especially in the gauge clusters. And one of the first companies to introduce a sort of digital gauge cluster, and, and that's been quite a success. Is that coming on to, or is that available on the new uh, Crossport? Yeah, of course it is. I mean, it's uh, the um, digital cockpits available. Um, I think SEL and SEL premium trims. Um, and I think you're going to see that versions of the digital cockpit coming in um, lower down uh, the ranges on a lot of vehicles. And, and it, you know, we've already got it on the Jetta, for instance. So I think that's going to be something that, you know, in the next few years is going to be something that comes in across the range. Um, and I, it's a really good feature. I mean, I'm, I'm a traditionalist and, you know, I like gauges and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's really nice if you, for instance, can have the navigation displayed between the two gauges like you can on the, the, the digital cockpit. Um, it's it's just a nice feature. You know, you don't have to take your eyes away from the dashboard and the road ahead of you to see what the navigation is telling you, which I think is a, kind of a safety feature as far as I'm concerned these days. Um, and and that's a that's a useful feature. I think a lot of times that it was strange to think that we would put the navigation unit in the in the front um, middle between both driver and passenger seats, and that's sort of how it traditionally started to to appear in vehicles because there wasn't much room on the cockpit. But now with the advancements of thin TFT screens and uh, people able to compact a lot of stuff now into a smaller space with the electronics not being so big and bulky, it ends up that you can actually get all that sort of stuff uh, even on the heads-up display in some of the higher trim vehicles as well, which I think is probably the next stage of that. But this is... The, you know the modernization of this vehicle and it's, it's very handsome and i think it'll do well is probably just half the story the other half of the story here is it's really the next evolution of vw offering jobs in the united states and and production in the united states because uh, this is obviously going to be produced in chattanooga at your factory there but it's sort of the beginning of a new chapter of the story isn't it yeah i mean basically we uh, we've invested another 340 million dollars to build the cross sport in chattanooga and we've actually also announced that we're, we're investing another 800 million um, to build the production version of the ID Cross electric compact SUV there, starting in 2022. So, um, you know, we're I think we're around 3,000 jobs down in Chattanooga, all told. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good story. I mean, the factory is great. The the town, you know, the, the interesting thing for me is, you know, we I, when I first joined the company, the town was, you know on its way back you could see but now in the past like eight and a half years um we went down to the, the chattanooga motor car festival down held downtown after we, we did the launch of the car to, to the media in, in the factory and you know the, the development is is going apace and it's it's you know a really thriving beautiful downtown area it's one of those you know sort of slightly under appreciated 
cities in the states, but it's certainly you know way in advance as of, of it was probably ten years ago. So you know that's investment from people like us, also from people like Amazon. But it's not just you know Volkswagen makes the investment. When we build a factory, you know you have to have stamping facilities, you have to have the suppliers move in, so it creates jobs all round. I think that uh, this being the beginning of uh, this journey, you're also looking at uh, taking the, 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 the factory to the next level when you bring in some electric production in the future. Yeah, for sure. And we're actually going to make the batteries at the factory as well. So um, hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully uh, people will dig electric cars and buy them. I mean, uh, I think in the rest of the world, you know, the legislation in places like China and parts of Europe is going to make electric cars a no-brainer. But in the States, you know, um, we, we hope that people really start to appreciate a long-range electric vehicle. I mean, I think, you know, I've been driving an e-Golf and that one's got a EPA range of 125 miles and I've been getting like 150 out of it, which is okay. I think if you have 225, 250 miles, I think they become a, a, a really viable proposition. And, you know, the nice thing about electric cars is you don't, they don't need as much servicing. So, you know, you're not putting gas in there, you're putting electricity in, which, depending on where you live, is a lot cheaper than putting fuel in. You, you get in the car every morning. It's fully, 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 fully charged, fully loaded, as it were. Um, and I think, you know, once people appreciate those factors and uh, the reduced cost of ownership, the, the basically the, the inherent reliability of an EV, um, I think they'll get you know really good traction. And, and hopefully, you know, it's that people aren't just buying Teslas because of Tesla. They're buying, you know, the people will be buying electric cars from other manufacturers. Just to make sure that uh, that it's all evenly spread, I get that too. Well, congratulations on on the new uh, Atlas uh, family member, the Cross Sport uh, price, and when when can we expect to see it arriving in showrooms? Um, arriving in showrooms, uh, some point in um, early early March, I guess, is when we're aiming, um, and then. Um, price, we said basically Scott Keogh, who's our CEO, announced that it will start lower than the Atlas. Um, so basically, I think, you know, at that point, I think it's less than 33 grand, I think is what he said. Um, so I think, you know, based the full pricing, we're not going to announce until the new year, but I think it'll be competitive. I mean, that's what we're aiming to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a pretty good pretty good package all told and you know just drove on the other day with the four cylinder um you know and you think that the four cylinder is going to be a penalty box but actually you know it's it's got a lot of torque it's it's quiet it's smooth um and you know it's it's the, the vehicle feels you know a lot lighter on its feet than the, the size would suggest right well i'll look forward to driving it when the ride and drive comes along mark gillies from vw uh are looking forward to seeing a brand new atlas on the road if you want to see pictures of it BW is the place to go. They have a great website. Our Auto Expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Well, catch up with previous episodes of the show on our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear the past shows, see automotive videos, and read insider car stories about your next ride. You'll find them all at ourautoexpert.com. Just posted the video of the brand new Nissan Titan truck updated for 2020, now with 400 horsepower and a lot of new interior features and safety features as well, including the Nissan 360 degree safety shield. So there's a question here. Do you feel good about Mitsubishi cars. They've been around for a long time in the United States. They have still been uh, selling vehicles, but they are a real value proposition. Even fully loaded, the new Mitsubishi 2020 Eclipse Cross SEL 1.5 liter with SAWC, which is their all-wheel drive system, is still with all the boxes checked, and I just did this, is still 3,000, uh, 3, uh, sorry, 34,000. Let's start that again because <laughs> Jen's getting her checkbook out. $34,870, <laughs> uh, which is about $475 a month uh, to buy or $311 a month for a lease with uh, about $4,000 down. So is it good value? Uh, Jen, do you feel confident in buying a Mitsubishi or do you feel like they're not... You know, the name. How does it resonate with you when I say Mitsubishi? Do you get excited or do you get, oh, I don't know. I'm middle of the road. I. You don't know. No, I'm a middle of the road kind of girl. 
Uh, I, there's other names that I would put first. Okay. Let's see, this is a good conversation. Uh-huh. Uh, would it change your mind if I told you that Mitsubishi have a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty on their cars? Oh, that's good. But I, for their cars, though, I do like the Outlander. Right, I was which is the bigger one. Yes, I was very impressed with that one. I have not been in the Eclipse Cross yet, right? so I can't give you too much information, but the Outlander by far was really nice vehicle. I got back from Phoenix yesterday, and I picked it up at the airport, and I, when I drove it, I... I was thinking to myself, um, you know, well, how do I feel about this? And I started to sort of look around at the gauges and the buttons. Now, it started to get a little more impressive. Like, mm-hmm. it actually has a touchpad on the uh, in between the driver and passenger seat, which relates to the screen, very similar to Lexus. You can tell the quality is uh, entry level, but at the same time, the amount of features, the safety features, the full emergency stop braking, the 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty, all of those sort of things come uh, quite excite. I mean, they excite me an awful lot. Plus, you, you, know, you can usually find them for a good deal. I mean, even if you find a fully loaded one on the lot that might be up for $34,000, you still can pay around thirty for it or around thirty. Two thousand dollars, just because uh, they tend to be heavily discounted. But I started to look at uh, some of the features that come with it. It also has this sort of connected subscription for twenty-four months uh, that gives you uh, that for zero amount of dollars with the uh, mobile app. You can use that to connect to the car and do a bunch of stuff. The safeguard services and remote services—they all come at zero price extra. And I try to look at this in relationship to buying another family SUV, perhaps like a Ford Escape, which would be something on the ex- a similar size. You know, to get all those services starts to cost more and more money. And Mitsubishi are offering them, you know, including the the uh, sort of all the special features for the price is considerably less. So as far as comparables, you're looking at what, Subaru, Crosstrek? Yeah, Ford Escape, Subaru, Crosstrek, those type Rogue. of... Rogue, yes. Uh, How about Rogue. the CHR? Yeah, CHR, maybe the, the CRV, the step up from the CHR, which is Honda. CHR is Honda's smallest SUV. The uh, CRV, which is the next one up, is probably more of a competition. Uh, sizes actually relate legally to the interior dimensions of vehicles, uh, according to the government. But the, those numbers are very twisted because if you look at it, the interior of a Mini and a Mustang are actually the same. So a Mini and a Mustang fall into the same category of vehicles. Uh, I know, that's size so weird. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense when you start to do that. So you have to, and a lot of vehicles fall between what traditional categories so they're actually as big as something uh i'll give you a great example uh that really shows you how um strange things can be in trying to size vehicles a jaguar xj which is their full-size sedan full-size sedan big old luxury car actually has the same interior space as the jaguar i-pace which is their (laughs) electric uh, little electric suv because, of course, when you have an electric vehicle, you don't need so much space on the inside. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that's kind of a bit difficult to work. But I would, I would cross shop a Mitsubishi uh, Eclipse Cross with a Ford Escape, probably. Would, now, what about the RAV4? RAV4 is the same size. Ooh. CRV, the same size. See, that yeah, would but be... look at the prices. You're talk- that's true. You're talking about prices that are considerably more. Exactly. So Uh, for the the price value? It's very good. All right, coming up, we're going to talk to Mr. Brandon Ramirez from Hyundai about their new electric vehicle, plus a concept that they had at the LA show. You're listening to Our Auto Expert and OurAutoExpert.com. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. If uh, you want to catch up with previous episodes of the show, the website is Our Auto Expert from the northwest to the southeast. It's America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, of course, we'll feature it on the show. On air, online, on mobile, or on smart speaker, this is Our Auto Expert. And uh, you can find uh, Truck Girl Jen on all of the social media website, uh, social media handles. So you, you did secure the handle for all of yourself, you know, Facebook or whatever. Yeah, I'm trying Instagram. to. I got Instagram going. Okay. You can see me underneath my truck trying to change the oil. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, first of all, when we talked a little bit about Mitsubishi, if we talk about Mercedes Benz, um, it's it's a whole different sort of kettle of fish. And Mercedes have been really lucky. And the CLA, which was a vehicle that they introduced, um, I think 
probably about 2014 in Washington, D.C., which, interestingly enough, I was there um, and when they introduced it. And it was the vehicle that they really, really wanted to uh, young up the audience, their Mercedes-Benz audience with. Uh, they found that their customers were getting much older. And I think one of the uh, interesting things is that they decided, you know, we want to do this, we want to young up people. And so they brought out a car which was much more dynamic, much more exciting, much more affordable. And initially, it started at thirty under thirty thousand dollars. You probably couldn't get one uh, you, that you wanted to drive for a lot less than that. But they were still uh, a very big price difference from a Mercedes when they brought this vehicle out. And the cool thing about that price difference is, of course, it attracted a whole bunch of people. Uh, a lot of those people that they attracted, they brought into Mercedes Benz from different uh, car companies you wouldn't expect them to do. One of those was Toyota. Uh, the other one was uh, Honda. Those people started to come over to Mercedes Benz because of the CLA, which is, I think, probably the smallest uh, car that they make in their um, car lineup. Yeah, there isn't one smaller than the CLA. Or oh, the A-Class is now actually smaller. And it brought all these people in. So about uh, 70% of those people coming to the Mercedes-Benz brand uh, from other, uh, other car companies. And they stayed. That was the thing that got them really excited. They actually stayed. Uh, those people decided that they were going to um, buy Mercedes on the second and, and third time around, which I think was exactly what they were trying to do with that small car. Then they brought out the AMG version of the vehicle. That was kind of cool. So I've been drive, you know, I drove the AMG down in Phoenix, uh, zero to sixty miles an hour in a decent four and a half seconds or four point eight seconds, I believe. Although I usually, and we were fairly high up at the Mercedes Benz ride and drive, I couldn't get the CLA to actually do. Um, a fast enough speed for me. So what I was having to do is uh, just sort of... In- really, Nick? <laughs> no, I couldn't get it to go 0 to 60 uh, uh, like far, as fast as I needed to do mm. it. Um, I don't know why. Usually I'm pretty good at getting to whatever the car company says, but it could have been that I was uh, 4,000 feet above sea level, which is usually an issue because you don't actually get so much oxygen into the engine. So that was, you know, that was the difficulty there. Uh, but they say 4.8. I was getting over 5. So it was kind of sad. Oh. Uh, huh. but I, have you ever tried to get what a company says there at a 60 miles an hour time? No. No. On a track, you know, we did it with a track hawk, which was really good. Um, I did it with a track hawk, uh, which is the Jeep Grand Cherokee, mm-hmm. 707 Love horsepower. It. Oh, the launch uh, control. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I did launch mode. That was pretty freaky. They, they say <laughs> they say you could get 3.5. Uh, seconds in that, mm. and I got 3.5 the first time and 3.4 the second time. I'm very proud of myself. I'm such a good driver. Yay. Uh, I, I actually think that probably what they did was uh, they did that for, um, you know, just to make journalists feel better about themselves. So probably. The c- so the CLA. Yeah. Did you like that better than the CLB? Uh, the CLB is the SUV version. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the CLA was. Uh, and when's the D coming? They have an E. When's the CLD? I don't know if there is one, actually. <laughs> there isn't. Know, not yet. <laughs> I don't know if there's ever going to be one. I'm sorry. Well, maybe uh, they should make one. Disappoint you. Well, uh, if you follow the alphabet, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh. So uh, the CLA right now, they're running really good deals on the okay. 2019. Tell me what 1.99% financing. See, that's the end of the year thing. Things mm-hmm. go crazy at the end of the year. Lease 299 for three um, years. That's not bad. 299 for a Mercedes? Yeah. See, that's exactly um, what people are getting into, you mm-hmm. know, is getting these vehicles towards the end of the year because they're so good, and especially the CLA, because if you want to – a lot of people getting into Mercedes, they really want to be in family luxury cars. The CLB, which we drove out there, is now the uh, – it's not the uh, smallest SUV they make. That's the CLA. But the CLB is the vehicle that's sort of this very boxy square. It looks more like the G-Wagon than any other vehicle that they have in their lineup, which I kind of like. But the CLB has actually uh, got a third row coming as well. They didn't have a third row when we tested it because we were testing early production models. But we did see a third row when they actually unveiled the car, which was in uh, Utah last, the end of la, no, the earlier this year, this summer, we got to see it for the first time. But that actually starts in the $40,000 range. And, you know, if you want to get it fully loaded, of course, uh, you could probably get it up much higher. But so, it's getting into a Mercedes, a third row, full family vehicle, I think, uh, decent price. Uh, for a luxury car, anyway. Go so, on. what's your favorite? Which is what? your favorite? Mercedes. Yes. Oh, the G wagon. Come on. 
Really? Uh, you ask anybody, what's your favorite Mercedes Benz? It's always going to be the G Wagon. No, it's not. What's your, what's your, well, your, your Oh, come girl, on. Jen. What do I like? Okay, never mind. I, <laughs> what do you like? The GT. Oh, uh, yeah. So GT is great, but it's not mm. practical, Jen. It is for me. How do you get all your stuff in there? How would you? I'm, so we went to the store and bought your, your parents' Christmas present. Can't say what it is because I know they're listening. Oh, the no, show. they already got it. Oh, they did? Yes, I got him a 65-inch television screen. Yeah. You, you ruined Christmas. No, I went over there and helped him set it up. Jesus' birthday is not until the 25th. Why it's did you do it early? Because of football season. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> All right. I'll let you off. Uh, yeah, so we went and did that. How would you have got that in a, in a Mercedes GT? Well, I'm going to keep it in my truck. Yeah, but how would you have got that in the GT? I wouldn't GT? have driven it to the store. Oh, so you have to have more than one car if you have a GT. Is I that have what you're three me? now. <laughs> but I'm just yeah. saying, to me, that's perfect because it's just me. Um, all right. I don't have five dogs. I have two cats that live at home. And, and you don't take them out in your car, right? No. Uh-uh. So right. it's perfect for me. All right. Just saying, it's just... <laughs> I don't know how you live with... I mean, it's a great car, don't get me wrong, but you have to have a second vehicle as well. Well, of course. And so. I wouldn't be driving every day starting at 159. Was it 50,000, 150,000? Right. Yeah. All right. Just saying, it's uh, it's really nice to have these ex- exotic sports. I like a GTR. Well, I like that, a Supra, but how do I get a large screen TV? Yeah, in but the that back? car makes me one. giggle. Oh, have you uh, have you you've driven it around corners? You know, and yeah. the bolsters tighten up. All right, um, you know, I get it. I get it. The bol- you know, it's a really nice car. Uh, it, it is one hundred fifty thousand. Aren't we on our rolls reversed? Aren't you the one that normally does this? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's turn to uh, Hyundai because at the LA Auto Show, uh, they introduced a lot of vehicles. Uh, one, the RM19 I got to drive, but they also introduced the Ionic, uh, which was the second generation of the vehicle. Joining us on the phone, Brandon Ramirez from Hyundai. Uh, so, Brandon, you upped the mileage of the Ionic, uh, what it can do on a single charge, the all-electric vehicle from Hyundai, but you, you kept the price the same. That was very nice of you. Yeah, uh, we're, we're very excited. On, on the electric, we actually improved the range from 124 miles to 170 miles. Um, and so uh, those that were thinking, oh, with the electric, it's going to have range anxiety, we answered that, that question. Um, also, uh, those three models we have on the Ionic family, we have the hybrid, the plug-in hybrid, and the electric. But the hybrid it has the, is the most fuel-efficient hybrid in the country at 59 miles per gallon on the highway. Wow. Uh, so you've, I mean, you've got records, records, and records. Uh, and is the Hyundai available nationwide, or is it to, like some of the other cars only available in uh, Peevzev states? Yeah, so, so for the hybrid, it's available nationwide. For the plug-in hybrid and the electric, it's going to be available in the, the 13 uh, 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 ZV states. And and then so there is also uh, you also have a hydrogen vehicle uh, which is the Nexo but is the Ionic just hi- is hybrid plug-in hybrid and electric right? Yeah, yeah, and and with the Nexo that that's a great vehicle, but it's only available in in California. But that one um, it fills up in, in in less than five minutes and has a range of three hundred and eighty miles and there's zero emissions. Which, you know, one of the things I like about Hyundai is a lot of the uh, the Japanese or Korean car companies are sort of playing around with uh, doing the odd electric car here or there. But you guys seem to have the full palette of electric and hybrid vehicles going. And you've always been a hard, like a force to be reckoned with in alternative fuels as well. Mm-hmm. Is that a big future for you, Brandon, is uh, alternative fuels at Hyundai? Yeah, so, so what we call it is we offer a full spectrum of alternative fuel vehicles. And... And that includes the hybrid, the plug-in hybrid, the electric, and all body styles. You know, for our hydrogen vehicle, it's, it's a SUV. Um, for our Kona electric, that's an SUV, too, that gets 258 miles of range. So the, um, the reason why we offer it is uh, different uh, buyers want different things. You know, some uh, don't want to charge, and so we have an alternative for them. And then at the LA show, we also got a kind of glimpse into the future of what Hyundai may be doing as well with the Vision T. So for those people that uh, missed it being revealed at the LA show, tell us a little bit about what that suggests of the future of Hyundai design and of fuel. Yeah, so uh, when you look at the vehicle uh, from a profile, it looks like it's in constant motion. And it applies what was applied to Sonata, and we call it... uh, 
uh, a sense of sportiness. And when you see the vehicle, oh, you have seen the vehicle, uh, but it it looks fantastic. And you can see images on our Hyundai News uh, site and, and see that it is, it's very exciting and very uh, sexy, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think it is too. Although, you know, I'm I'm wondering if it's a bit strange to call a vehicle sexy. Although no, I, I not do think at all. It, I love that I, front. I, I, <laughs> so it has this weird, uh, not weird, but very cool uh, sequence when you actually sort of power the vehicle up of lighting, doesn't it, Brandon? Yeah, so so it, it lights up from. Uh, it, it, there's LEDs that turn on from the the cascading grill and and into the headlights and it, it is is phenomenal and it looks fantastic and we also have a video of how that works uh, on our site as well but know- it's fantastic it, it looks very innovative I noticed that you did sort of similar uh, the the grill shape of that vehicle is sort of reflected of what's currently available in your grill although it's not identical uh, the sort of the shapes tend to remain the same as well so it's a suggestion maybe of what things may come in some of your other vehicles yeah so what what that that was a vision T concept is is a uh, a design signature of what we're going to be doing for uh, some possible future models in, in, in the future. But the, the one, the Vision T is a compact SUV. So um, also, uh, since we're talking about alternative fuels, that's a plug-in hybrid as well. All right. Um, I'd buy that one. I, no, I think it, it does look really gorgeous <laughs> as well. Um, and then you sort of got very adventurous with the new Sonata, which I drove last week. Uh, that has this sort of adventurous lighting pattern up the front as well, but it also has a, a lot of adventurous technology, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. So what we call uh, – there's a great feature called uh, Remote Smart Parking Assist. And uh, let's say someone parks right next to you, and you, it's going to be very difficult for you to um, open up your, your, your door uh, when you get inside the vehicle. So what you can do is with remote, remote smart parking assist, outside of the vehicle, you can back out of the parking space. Or if you want to get into a tight parking space, you can get out of the vehicle and you can, um, uh, you can park it yourself. Uh, and it, it'll it'll go in automatically. I did with, uh, the, with the key fob. I did put a video of that on Facebook. I think it's already got about twenty thousand views. It was uh, a whole lot of fun. Brandon, thanks for joining us. The thing I like mostly about that remote park uh, feature is that if there's a space that you look at, Jen, when you go to uh, to the shopping mall, you go, I can't get in there. Yeah, I can. I'll shut both doors and drive the car in with a key fob, and then now the, the other people can try and get out as well. Oh, that's my goal, anyways. I will get in that car. <laughs> <laughs> get in that uh, coming up, more stuff on our auto expert, including uh, Mike Cadell. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Locally created, now she's celebrated from the northwest and southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on mobile, or on smart speaker. This is Our Auto Expert. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with Truck Girl Jen. And we are talking about uh, some interesting things that are happening in the industry. Uh, I have noticed a trend of car companies becoming more sustainable with taking some organic parts and some recycled parts and using them inside of cars. Ford is probably the leader in this with their soy seats and recycled water bottles for the interior. Mazda also trying to do things like use mushrooms to make car parts. But there is a new chapter with Ford. Ford and McDonald's, and uh, Debbie's joining us from Ford to talk about McDonald's joining forces with Ford to use coffee bean waste in car parts. Now, Debbie, the first question has got to be, what happens when it rains? Do they wash away? No, no, no. So (laughs) using the coffee staff, which is the skin from uh, when you roast coffee beans, a, a really fine skin peels off of it. And so that skin is mixed with plastic and then molded into parts. Okay, so we're good. replacing a very heavy mined uh, mineral that we used to use with a very lightweight coffee chaff. So we're reducing the part weight by 25%. All right. So what sort of car parts, is, um, or unless it's still a secret, are you going to use this in? Where will we, where will we find this inside the car? Yeah, so we're excited. There's no secret here. Um, We are going to start putting this on the headlamp housing, so the backing of the headlamps on the Lincoln Continental to start, and then we have a migration plan to roll out to other vehicles as well. The reason we picked a headlamp housing is because two light bulbs go through that housing and they create a lot of heat, and this material actually has better heat performance higher 20 degrees celsius heat performance 
improvement compared to the old material we were using. I have a question for you. Is What color is it? I mean, did you guys change the color? Is it still like that dark brown or... That's an awesome question. I don't think anybody's asked that question. So we generally take our plastic and we add carbon black to it. Okay. And in this case, it is a very, very dark brown, um, almost black as well. But with certain really high lights, you can see the copy color in the background. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Debbie, so I think it's really- if I go to my Lincoln that has this part in it. Are you going to start and, licking the headlamp? No, stop. <laughs> and I go to the hood, and I open the hood, and I put my head under the hood, and I take a long, deep sniff. <laughs> will I smell coffee? You will not. Oh. I know. I love coffee, so I'm the first to say, ah, oh, give me coffee smell. Is it? But um, unfortunately, when we process the material, the, all of the odor is removed. And, but that does allow us to use this lightweight, robust material in the future for interior applications because we do sell to a, an occasional customer that doesn't like the smell of coffee. I'm disappointed in the lack of <laughs> tastes there are and smells there are in these cars when organic parts are used. <laughs> I want to be able to lick things. and no, I don't <laughs> See, <really>. told you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just... I'm disappointed that we can't go a little bit more crazy uh, because there seems to be more and more organic parts being used in cars. Are you, uh, you know, Debbie, are you experimenting with other things in the future? Are you looking at other materials that could be used? Uh, maybe you're looking for other applications for coffee or other organic materials? Yeah, so I've, I've been at this for 20 years in the lab. I'm actually the person that launched Soy Foam into the Ford Mustang in 2007. It's now on every vehicle Ford makes. We Congratulations. Have wheat straw bins. Thanks. We have wheat straw bins on our cars. We have rice hulls under hood components. So that's after the food portion of rice is removed, the hull is left over. It also has good heat properties. So we have it under hood in the F-150. We've had coconut fiber, um, cellulose from trees last year. So we've been really, really focused on this effort of using plant-based above the ground waste material. Uh, But this is the first one where we're actually working with another major industry and another big company like McDonald's. So we're excited about circular economy and the future where we exchange um, materials that are off all from our processes with each other instead of landfilling. Take me through the process. How does the coffee bean start? Where does it start and how does it end up in the Ford? Yeah, so McDonald's is a big, big coffee supplier, over a billion cups of coffee a year, two and a half million cups a day. So they grow their coffee in Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Costa Rica, many, many coffee plantations. The beans are shipped to many roasters. The roasters, when they're roasting, they generate the tap as a side product because the bean sort of peels during the high heat process and the chaff is left in pretty much the form that we need it. Then it's shipped to our um, material supplier called Competitive Green Technologies in Ontario, Canada. They do some processing, some chemical magic to compound it with plastic and make pellets. And then Varrock, um, a headlamp supplier, molds the part for us. All right. So it's kind of a long process. And, you know, our dream is to make these um, not ship the materials all over the place, keep them in, at least we kept them within North America this time, um, but to keep them local in the very end, use what's agriculturally available right where we're assembling the car. All right. I mean, I, I'm kind of excited about uh, all these different things doing it. I think we probably need to get uh, all of these things together and uh, put them all in piles so we can see what starts and then eventually what ends up in the car as well. I'm glad, I, I've probably got a few suggestions for you, too, that things that you should okay. be using. I want to be able to smell uh, uh, deep fried food and strawberries, too. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, who came up with this idea? I mean, did somebody just say, hey, let's try a coffee bean in the car. I mean, these are some amazing things you guys come up with. We are a group that loves to have fun in the laboratory. Good. Believe it or not, scientists like to have fun, and I always have a cup of coffee attached to me. So it was startling. One day I walked into the lab with this big, big mug, looked at it and said, hey, there's got to be waste here. There's got to be something, you know. So the team... I don't know why they listened to me, but they went away, <laughs> they started to explore, and 
they came back and said, you know, what about chaff? And um, so they, you know, thought about that as a waste product. We contacted McDonald's, and they were super enthusiastic because, really, there's not many things you can do with chaff. And so a lot of times it gets lit on fire to get rid of it. Why not use it for some durable product? All right. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, arriving in uh, Fords and Lincolns of the future. Debbie from Ford, who is the uh, senior technical leader of, uh, of their very brilliant program now, in which we're using McDonald's coffee. Coming up, more stuff on Our Auto Experts. Stand by. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on mobile, or on smart speaker. This is our auto expert. Half of our auto expert is in Nashville right now. Mike Quadell. Uh, Mike, there's some big news that's happened this week in Nashville. Uh, the fact is that Nissan has asked some of its workers to take a bit of a break. This is becoming a routine, isn't it, for us guys? <laughs> right, being on the show, week, on the radio, absolutely. Hanging out. I'm liking this. Awesome. Um, yeah, big, big news. Uh, big news. Latter part of this week, uh, Nissan uh, sent an announcement out to its entire U.S. staff that they're going to furlough uh, the entire U.S. group the first two days of the new year without pay, and it's because sales are declining. So they're working to make some. Uh, market adjustments for it. So definitely kind of some, it was a big news week. Uh, I know we're always talking about shiny cars and fun things that we're doing, but uh, I think as we ramp into the holiday season and get towards Christmas, everyone's trying to make adjustments as we move into the new year. So the first two days right into the new year, Nissan, which includes infinity will, will obviously furlough off uh, its entire U S entire U S employee staff for those first two days to just cut some, cut some costs. Um, do you think this paints a poor picture? Is this something that really should be a red flag, or is it something that it's just a wise financial decision? Well, auto sales as a whole, uh, if you just look at the entire industry, um, they're, they're not up. They're, they're really kind of running flatline right now. And I think it just is a, an indication that on the Nissan side that they might they're, you know, they're making smart adjustments. They don't want to fall into the issue that Ford Motor Company and General Motors fell into uh, a few years back with the bankruptcy situation. So I think they're trying to make some market adjustments. I think two days of a work furlough, and as much as it hurts, um, those that are working for the company, I think it's a necessary thing that needs to be done to hopefully uh, you know, make some adjustments as they go into the new year. It's uh, to me, you know, Nissan has had some rocky things happen this year. The Carlos Gomez uh, scandal, uh, him imprisoned in Japan, um, a few other little bits and pieces. Uh, they've had some great new product coming out, like the 2020 Titan, uh, the new Versa, the new Sentra. They're all things that are going to help the company. But it seems like, despite having some solid new product, they're still waning a little bit. Where the rest of the industry, looking at some of the sales figures, uh, the Everyone seems to be doing much better than expected. We were expected to be somewhere around 6.5 million cars sold in 2019. It looks like now we're back on track to be the same sales figures as last year, somewhere around 17 million. But uh, Nissan seemed to be not faring as well as the rest of the industry. Yeah, and they need to bring some new... I mean, the bottom line is you need to bring some slightly newer vehicles to market with some new nameplates on them. It's hard to compete when... Ford Motor Company comes up, comes out with a Ford Mach E, uh, shows off an incredible new vehicle at a, you know an auto show. Uh, the Titan is new for the brand, um, but if you are a hardcore truck enthusiast, you just, you have to evaluate you know other trucks on the market. They're still going with that 5.6 liter motor, and then they obviously announced they're going to do away with the diesel. So there's just some you know some interesting trends, but you know it, it, I, I won't throw it all on Nissan this week. There was a lot of crazy news. Um, happening in the auto industry. I mean, if we look at it, Mitsubishi, this was the last week for the team in California uh, to be on board there. They're actually moving here to Tennessee. They're partially owned by Nissan. So Mitsubishi is going to be here. And then ten, ten, the 10 Group, which stands for the Enthusiast Network, uh, is the owner of a ton of automotive buff books, print publications, and they announced uh, this week that they will no longer offer 19 of their on-paper magazines. So four-wheel and off-road, a big publication, automobile, 
uh, Hot Rod, and then, of course, Truck Trend being the, the biggest one. Super Street, Super Chevy, all these publications are going away um, and, and away from print and moving towards digital. So just a, a week of really interesting news in the auto industry. I think that's almost been long expected now because the only time I really see magazines being sold is on, you know, in airport uh, convenience stores as you board a plane where a lot of people buying car magazines there. But I'm I'm not seeing magazines, uh, you know, even if you go into doctor's offices, magazines there sometimes are sort of, you know, six months old. They're not, uh, it's not the place where you used to find the magazine. So we already know that print has been waning in some forms or other, uh, you know, being reconstituted. Constituted. I know that a lot of car companies uh, or companies that are what we call buff books have been changing their magazines. You know, they used to do monthly magazines. Now they're changing them to special editions. They'll do a special muscle car version. The paper's thicker. There's a lot more in the magazine. But you might only see that sort of version coming out once every six months. Uh, special editions are becoming the bigger thing rather than these sort of monthly magazines that you would buy on subscription. And so I'm not super surprised to see some of these going away. But uh, do you think that these companies, they have a lot of crossover, you know, sort of Motor Trend and Automobile and all of these things do a lot of the same stuff, slightly different writing styles. Do you think that they're all going to uh, culminate in one website or they're still going to keep the individual 19 websites going? No, it'll it'll they'll start to consolidate, and then I'll start offering continue offering more digital footprints. So if you look at Motor Trend, Motor Trend is massive, and I mean their footprint on digital alone. And you know we both uh, share with a mutual friend, Sean Holman, who is the editor in chief of Truck Trend, and you know his his digital footprint just continues to grow with his podcast, and we're going to continue to see the trend towards digital uh, content in the industry. It's just the way of the world, and Frankly, I enjoy it. Um, reading magazines is, is fun. It's what you and I grew up on. Um, but it's pretty cool to be able to, to look at five different reviews within 15 minutes uh, online. Um, I, I'll share some, some shiny sun news uh, announced this week. Um, Ford Motor Company came out, and they're going to be uh, making their, their headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, pet-friendly. And it's to attract new uh, talent to the company. So we just, you and I talked about the Ford Mach-E. We came off the LA Auto Show. It's new. It's fresh. It's different. And uh, to attract attract top talent, they're finding that the younger generation of those coming into the industry, they're upward mobile. They want less time behind a desk. They want to be surrounded by their their uh, furry friends. And so kind of a fun little story of a Ford Motor Company to bring a little bit of brightness to the uh, to the industry. It was one of our most, uh, I guess, looked at stories uh, this week when we posted it on social media. And I think it's a great story, too. And seeing my friends who work for Ford in the office with their dogs was kind of cool. But I think subliminally what it tells us is a completely different message is that the people that are changing the industry, the people that are forming the industry, the people that have the knowledge to move the industry forward – are all dog lovers, and that should be the big <laughs> message there. <laughs> they are dog lovers. I'll, I'll share an interesting, and I will not share a name for confidentiality purposes, but I went to an event last year, and I was at an event, and they were showcasing a new vehicle, and their setup, the entrance, the feel, the, the whole entire program was amazing. And... I looked at and talked to this person that was on one of the teams, and I said, man, you have got to love cars to be able to pull an event like this off. And this person turned to me and said, I I actually don't really care about cars, but I care about branding, and I care about marketing, and I care about finding the right person for our vehicles. And it was just kind of a telltale to me that the people that were in the industry years ago that loved cars don't necessarily love cars. They love lifestyle. With lifestyle come dogs. Yep. Absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. My I think bro- that my boss bring his dog <laughs> brings their dog to work every day, and it makes the office change. It Although does. it's hard, and you, Mike, you will know this as we uh, we run out of time here, to, uh, running up to news. But you'll know this. I sit in my office every day trying to type, <laughs> and every three minutes I get an elbow under uh, a nose under the elbow with a bone in it, going, <laughs> uh, 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 "Come on, play, come on, play." And I know you have a Labrador yep. too. You probably get the same thing. 
I, I do. I sent you that picture uh, text. Uh, you and I are traversing the country this last week, and I sent you the picture of my dog sitting on uh, the front porch. You know, here in the south, we have these cool front porches, and his head was, his body was on the front porch. His head was was leaning inside the front door, looking for the next person to come <laughs> play with him. So uh, Mike, our dogs are our lives. Mike Cadell, our auto expert dot com is where you can see his video. His GT five hundred video is up there. Check that out. Coming up, we still have Anton Warman on our auto expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Welcome back to Our Auto Expert. I'm Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen. Uh, Jen, about a year and a half ago uh, at Pebble Beach Concord at Elegant, you're already like, eh, whatever. Uh, I got to drive the new GTR 50. I the know, Nissan I'm so GTR jealous. 50. They only are making 50 of these vehicles. It is a special edition, hand-built by Ital Design, and they cost... Uh, $1,050,000. I know. Shall I take your order right now? Yes, please. Uh, this is, of course, <laughs> a super souped-up version of the GTR. And uh, the big news today is, of course, they actually go on sale. Uh, or they're delivering some of them. I think they were only going to make 50 of them. They sold 12 of them at the event. Uh, but it's it's really been an interesting ride. So I was supposed to get two laps around uh, the racetrack uh, with this uh, Laguna Seca racetrack and I actually got four because the designer who sat next to me in the passenger seat as we came into towards the pits for the second lap just waved me on and said continue going continue going so I went and all the guys you know with the headsets on and the race gear who changed the tires and everything on the end of the track they're just standing there like hey why is he going around again huh uh, because it's a Nicomai, uh, yes, so that's yeah. the why. <laughs> They're all Italian because, of course, it was Italian design. Uh, so they were like, oh, crazy, what is he doing? Um, and uh, and I did two laps in it. I did go a little fast. I, I came around the corner, the very last corner on the uh, lap number four, three, I think it was, and the back end may have slipped out from under me and may have done a little bit of a side uh, a side slide, but it was very, very cool. Well, it's impressive that it's a V6 engine, a 3.6 liter that offers 710 horsepower. C uh, or 720, a 3.8 liter V6, yeah, 720. Yeah. Depends who you who you look at. Yeah. I haven't personally gone under there with the equipment and measured the horsepower, but anything over 700 is a little bit. You probably have to put a towel down on the seat before you. Yeah, drive but a V6. It. Yes, a I V6. Mean, that's impressive. Uh, it's, so what? It, what does that show you? They can make V6s aren't boring. I know. All right. That's totally what I'm looking for. Because I'm a V8 kind of girl, you know. But it is a million and fifty thousand dollars, Jen. Well. All right. Uh, From one end of the scale to the other end, from using loads of gas to using little gas, and uh, we're joined by Anton Warman. He's an independent analyst and investor. You can read much of Anton's stuff at the street or Seeking Alpha. So, Anton, tell me what is going on in the world of EVs. And General Motors is opening a factory in Ohio. That's right, because of all of the government mandates in multiple geographies to sell a certain percentage of all new vehicles with a very heavy battery load, most likely in many cases. They are pure battery electric vehicles. In other cases, there will be plug-in hybrid vehicles. The demand for batteries, the sheer tonnage, is skyrocketing, and many of these batteries today are made in all sorts of places outside of North America, such as in Japan, in China, and in Europe. You may have noted, for example, that the batteries that are being put in the Audi e-tron and the Jaguar I-Pace and also in the Ford uh, Mustang Mach-E that was announced a couple of weeks ago, they all are made in Poland. So this is going to be a major new investment, a joint investment by LG and General Motors to build a $2.5 or so billion dollar a battery plant uh, somewhere in Ohio, and uh, conceptually, it, it's supposed to replace at least part of the workforce that is being uh, let go as a result of uh, GM's shutdown of its Lordstown, Ohio plant. I always question some of GM's uh, business plans. Uh, it's always been a head scratcher, but this one seems to make a lot of sense. There is definitely a need, and therefore a demand, and they are just going to fill that demand. Are they the only ones that are going to be building new battery factories? No, uh, there are others as well. Right now, already under construction, 
there is a factory uh, underway in North Georgia, right near the Tennessee border, uh, that is owned by another uh, Korean company called SKI. It's building this plant so as to supply Volkswagen for their new electric SUV that will be built in Chattanooga, Tennessee, starting in the first half of 2022. So that plant is going to be finished in uh, just over a year from now and uh, will be in production with these batteries in uh, 2021. Just before the break, tell us, are these batteries going to go exclusive to GM uh, factory, uh, GM vehicles, or is there a chance that GM could be building factories for third parties? Or, or batteries? Well, the one, in, the one in Ohio certainly seems at first glance to be a GM-exclusive captive, uh, captive buyer of uh, those batteries, but I don't think we can exclude the possibility that if this factory is large enough and the volumes somehow aren't there, for GM that they wouldn't be willing to sell excess capacity to others, but the company made no statement either way about uh, uh, the extent that uh, to the extent that that would uh, would have a chance of happening or not. All right. Well, it looks like uh, GM have made some good investments. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue to talk to Anton, including uh, some of the things like uh, sales of EVs, uh, electric EV sales numbers in Europe uh, for Tesla in the Netherlands. We'll talk about that. Also, uh, Hyundai, they have some battery uh, news going on, plus uh, the new Tesla pickup as well. That's battery news as well. Uh, if you want to hear previous interviews that we've had with Anton and all of our other guests, you can go to the website, ourautoexpert.com. Uh, there you can hear past shows, see our automotive videos, and uh, read insider car stories about your next ride. You'll find it, find it all there at ourautoexpert.com. I wanted to promote a couple of videos that went up this week. We got to drive the new RM19, which is a test vehicle from Hyundai. It'll look uh, forward to what their electric vehicles will look like in the future. Right now, it's a rear or mid-engine vehicle in gas, but soon it will the electric. That video is up on ourautoexpert.com. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. On Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Conversation continues. Just direct messages if you have a question. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the EV factory that GM are building with Anton Wallman in uh, Ohio. And uh, there are also um, a lot of other electric pieces of news going on today. China to end the EV subsidies in favor of mandates on automakers. So translate that for us, Anton. What does that mean for customers in China? Yeah, so thus far, China has been using the subsidy tool the direct government subsidy tool in order to encourage people to buy more electric vehicles. And by doing so, you got up to three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000, depending on the type of car uh, in question, in order to, um, to buy an electric car. But uh, starting in the middle of 2019, the Chinese government started to reduce the amount that you would get, and they're going to be reducing it further, or at least such as the current plan, starting after the end of 2020. And instead, the tool that they are going to use in order to push the market in favor of EVs is to simply force the automakers to sell a certain percentage of their output in the form of electric vehicles. So this is a little bit of what uh, California and a few other states in the U.S. is doing, as well as what Europe is doing. They have a bit of a hybrid approach in that they are first and foremost forcing the automakers to sell a certain percentage of their output as EVs. And then on top of that, some of those states and geographies in Europe also have some additional subsidies on top of that. But the primary driver uh, in terms of implementing the policy is to simply force the automakers to sell uh, a number, be it 10, 15, or 20, or some similar percentage of their output by a certain year uh, in the form of EVs. And they do that by calculating it slightly differently based on uh, CO2 output and other means. But at the end of the day, it boils down to the same thing. So China is therefore making the shift to say, let's have the automakers themselves pay for this, which, of course, in turn translates to simply higher prices for all other automobiles. So that is the path that China appears to be choosing uh, 
for the handful of years ahead at this point. Now, to buy a gas vehicle in China is uh, is very precarious. I mean, first of all, you can buy a vehicle with no problem if you have the finances to cover it. But to get a license plate, you know, they give out very few of those every single year. But with EVs, it's much easier to get a license plate. So overall, what do you think this is going to do to the sale of electric vehicles in China? Well, it depends on where they ultimately set that number. I mean, there was talk of uh, about 20 five uh, percent of the output having to be EVs going forward, and that would obviously uh, mean a huge increase in the sale of EVs. I mean, China today has sales close to 30 million cars per year, so that would be about 7.5 million units per year. Currently, they're selling in the order of per year. So uh, that would be a huge dump here in the next uh, handful of years. In terms of the restrictions on buying non-electric cars, they're primarily applied in the largest cities like Beijing and Shanghai. But if you live out on the out on the countryside and they're equivalent of the Great Plains and uh, flyover states, uh, then it's a lot easier. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to sell almost 30 million cars per year to begin with. So that you can certainly get a license in those areas, but it's very, very hard if you live in these largest cities. But if you then get an EV instead, you do get a license very, very quickly uh, in those other larger cities. All right, let's turn to Europe and their electric car sales. So Tesla numbers uh, have been arriving, and where do we stand? Well, so uh, the month, for, uh, the numbers for the month of November are in, and the interesting statistic coming out of Europe for Tesla is that for the Model 3, they sold right about 8,000 cars in Europe in the month of November, between 8,000 and 8,100, and half of them, right about 4,000 even, went to a single country, and certainly not one of the largest ones, and that happens to be the Netherlands, where they sold right about 4,000 cars. And you may ask, well, why is this? Well, the answer is simple. Um, starting January 1st, uh, the Netherlands will start subsidizing their electric cars less. And what's happening in the meantime is that leasing companies in the Netherlands are buying up large quantities of Model 3s to the tune of about 300 cars a day at the current rate right now. And they're going to uh, spend the next couple of years leasing them out to end customers. But the sales are recorded now before 2019 is over so that those leasing companies can take advantage of the existing government subsidies that uh, partially go away here come January 1st. Do you think the future for Tesla looks good in Europe or is it still sort of unstable? Well, it's a mixed bag depending on the country because uh, to the extent that subsidies are going up, uh, they will be helped to some degree or another, but they are not the only variable because starting January 1st here, another thing happens in Europe, and that is that the big quotas for electric cars from all automakers start kicking in. So all of the other automakers, such as Volkswagen and Renault and Fiat, and you go down the list, all of them, they've been holding back in 2019 because any electric vehicle they sold in 2019 did not give them much benefit to meet these quotas. So they've been given given any kind of excuses in the recent months to simply not sell an electric car in Europe. However, you can bet your last living penny or euro, you know, starting on January 1st, that they will suddenly discover, oh, my God, we've just found these 50,000 cars that were just sitting on some back lot in Poland or Germany or some other place, and, oh, by the way, they're suddenly available, and, oh, by the way, we've got to sell them at this very discounted price. So you're going to see a massive increase from all automakers in Europe, except Tesla, uh, for uh, electric vehicle sales, because the only company that had no disincentives to sell an electric vehicle in 2019 was Tesla. So Tesla got a disproportionately uh, large share of the market in 2019, and it's going to be a lot rougher for them here starting January 1st when all other automakers are going to turn on the spigot. What uh, you've been having a conversation with Hyundai about their battery prices, and what have they been telling you? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, you will see a lot of like, academic and uh, similar papers being written by all sorts of parties, such as Bloomberg New Energy Research and so forth, talking about battery prices coming down. They're going to go to first uh, hundred dollars per kilowatt hour, and then they're going to go way below that, and therefore only in the next couple of years we're going to see battery electric vehicles simply become cheaper than regular internal combustion engine cars. And what uh, Hyundai has told me is that those numbers are not quite accurate. 
basically, first of all, they only count the battery cell cost, but the entire battery system, the cooling, the heating, the electronics, the management, and the packaging cost an enormous amount of money on top of that. And those prices, when you take the entire cost, are far, far, far higher. So when we see some of these happy numbers being thrown about that show that electric cars are falling so much in price and will be so cheap so very soon, I simply don't quite agree with that. Prices are coming down, but not nearly at the rate and not nearly to the absolute level that is being uh, often talked about in the broader mass media. Uh, Hyundai, of course, uh, one of the car companies that have a number of models out, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, electric and, uh, and hydrogen as well. And we talked to Brandon Ramirez on this show this morning about uh, Hyundai, and the fact is that they are forging forward with their alternative fuel program. Are they a force to be reckoned with? Because it's always really been sort of uh, Ford and Toyota at the top of the tree. But the, the Hyundai group, which includes Kia, are pushing really hard for alternative energies. They are, and you will see you will see this bifurcation very much here as we enter 2020 in about three or four different ways. First of all, in Europe, for regular passenger cars, Hyundai and Kia being subject to the same rules that will govern all of these vast increases by other automakers, such as Volkswagen, they will see an enormous increase in battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids in Europe starting just next month already. So you will see their spigot being turned on. Uh, in the U.S., you will see a slower adoption here in the near term because the numbers simply are not as strict for 2020. So while we certainly will get more and better models coming up here in the next year, don't expect huge quantities here. In the whole market in South Korea, where, of course, Hyundai and Kia dominate, you will see a couple of things happen. In the very near term, you will see an enormous increase there as well of both battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. But they're also making a huge investment for um, hydrogen um, fuel cell cars that will come in just a few years from now. So if you look forward, they have a model out now called the Nexo, which is very attractive. But the major volume models are still a few years out. And finally, for the commercial vehicle segment, like large trucks, they're actually uh, selling 1,600 very large commercial trucks into Switzerland, where they will serve as distribution uh, vehicles for all sorts of uh, you know, retail companies like uh, food distributors and the like. So uh, that is going to be the biggest deployment in Europe in Europe of uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, vehicles, and that starts here imminently. The production has already started in the last two months. Uh, let's turn our attention to Tesla and their pickup truck, which gained a lot of attention and some considerable uh, people investing a in hundred dollar refundable in buying one of these vehicles. So Tesla are now announcing that they will build this vehicle in reverse order. What does that mean? Well, when they first announced the product a couple of weeks ago, they said we'll start making the cheapest ones, the forty and fifty thousand dollar base. Uh, versions. We'll start with them at the end of 2021, and then a year later, we'll make the one with the longest range and most power and so forth uh, a year later at the end of 2022. Uh, Tesla came out just the other day and said, uh, we're going to reverse that. We're going to start by making the most expensive one with the longest range at the end of 2021, and then go to the cheaper ones after that. That's the way they've done it traditionally, but all of this is, I think, just shuffling the deck on the far more important issue of uh, the fact that these prices are just not realistic in the eyes of almost any observer that I've spoken to in the automotive industry. They look at the specs in terms of how much range and payload and so forth that go into these pickup trucks, and they all say the same thing. You cannot make these pickup trucks at anywhere near these prices at which they are saying to the world that they are going to sell them. So uh, something's got to give here long term. But in the meantime, uh, this is what Tesla is promising to their customers. And uh, we'll see what, if any of this comes to pass. I mean, they haven't uh, uh, started construction of a pickup truck factory uh, yet. So uh, I can I can be pretty confident in saying that these um, pickup trucks are going to be probably late to market. They're not going to be making uh, this timeline. They're not going to be uh, able to be purchased in volume by the end of 2021. I think that's, uh, that's an almost safe bet at this point. Final question. Who's going to be first to market with an electric pickup? Ford, GM, Tesla, or Rivian? Well, right now it's Rivian, right? So Rivian uh, has announced a timeline that's the most aggressive of them. And then to the extent that anybody cares, it's Bollinger. That will be a few months behind them with a more expensive truck. 
And then at the very end of 2021, we have Ford, GM, and Tesla that have all said fourth quarter 2021, we'll see who, we'll see who actually manages to deliver on that timeline. My money is on uh, GM and Ford in no particular order. And then we'll see uh, how close Tesla gets to uh, deliver just a handful of expectedly pre-production vehicles or whether they can actually enter proper volume production anywhere near uh, that time frame. And this has really disabled Tesla's sort of first-to-market thing because obviously with uh, the a lot of their electric vehicles, they were first-to-market uh, and they owned that market. But this time they're going up, up against four others within a very short time space. So uh, time will tell. Anton Wallman is an independent analyst and investor. You can read his uh, majority of his stories at The Street or Seeking Alpha. Uh, Very interesting reads, a deep dive into business and exactly what's going on in the EV and autonomous car field. If you want to listen to Anton or any other of the segments from this show or previous shows, you can find them all at our website, which is ourautoexpert.com. You can also find all of our TV coverage of the automotive industry there, including some of our car reviews and you can go to social media and direct messages on either instagram facebook or the twitters and we'd be happy to respond to you from chuck joel jen in the our auto expert studio i'm nick miles and we'll see you again on the next episode of our auto expert you've been listening to our auto expert with nick miles find all the show episodes at our please follow us on all social media twitter facebook and instagram at our auto expert and message us for a quick and witty response